السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد All thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may his peace and blessings be upon his last and final messenger, his family, his companions and those who follow them until the end of times. So alhamdulillah yesterday we talked about some few introductory points regarding the Qur'an and how we're supposed to approach it and study it. So we talked about this particular mindset, this particular attitude that we're supposed to have when approaching the study of the Qur'an. And the most important, the most fundamental thing is to remember who the Qur'an is from. That it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord, our Creator, who is the all-knowing, the all-wise, the all-merciful. And having that in mind when reading the Qur'an and when studying it. And then we also talked about a brief intro to Surah Al-Hujurat itself and the concepts of akhlaq and adab. And how important they are to Muslim identity. So regarding Surah Al-Hujurat, Sayyid Qutb rahimullah he wrote, this surah composed of no more than 18 verses is majestic, indeed superior. It includes a number of basic facts of faith, Islamic law and human existence. It opens before our hearts and minds wide horizons and gives rise to a host of important thoughts. It refers to systems of formation and organization, principles of education and upbringing, fundamentals of legislation and essential directives which could take a hundred times its length. So basically he's explaining the beauty of the surah and the comprehensiveness of the surah. That despite it being so short, despite it only having 18 verses, it's still an extremely important and extremely significant surah that contains a lot of guidance, a lot of morals, and specifically, akhlaq and adab. Alright, now as I mentioned last week, that's another name of the surah as well, or yesterday, right? It's called suratul akhlaq and suratul adab. Because of the emphasis it places on ethics, morals, and manners, and the role that they play in establishing an upright, peaceful, and noble society. So the surah basically what it's doing is guiding us towards the proper manners that we're supposed to show in a Muslim society. Right? And how that Muslim society is supposed to be organized. So it's literally teaching us how to nurture and care for our own communities so that they can be productive and successful. So the surah starts out by laying five fundamental manners. It talks about five fundamental manners or adab that we're supposed to have. The first is obeying Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the primary adab, the most important etiquette, the most important manner that we're supposed to have has to do with our obedience to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second is honoring and respecting the rank of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Recognizing his status, recognizing his place, right? Giving him his due respect because of who he was and what he did. The third is verifying sources. Making sure that what we're listening to, what we've been told, any news that we're reading or listening to is verified, it's authentic. The fourth is the prohibition of mocking and ridiculing others. The prohibition of making fun of other people. And the fifth is the prohibition of spying, backbiting, and thinking ill of others. And again, all of these have to do with this concept of adab and akhlaq. And when it comes to manners, when it comes to akhlaq, there are those that are specific and then those that are general. So there are specific adab that we're supposed to have for specific individuals. And then there's more general adab, right? General adab that we just have in our normal behavior, our normal character with everyone else. So it talks about the specific ones initially. So the specific adab are those that we're supposed to show towards the Prophet And that's what the surah starts off with, right? The first adab, the first etiquettes that are mentioned are how we're supposed to speak to the Prophet how we're supposed to act with him, how we're supposed to interact with him. Right? It then talks about the more general manners that deal with our relationships with one another. So in the first five verses of the surah, the first five verses of the surah, Allah teaches us, His faithful servants, 
the good manners we should observe with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which are respect, honor, and esteem. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala starts by saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tuqaddimu bayna yaday Allahi wa rasoolih, wa attaqullah, inna Allah sami'un alim. That, O oh, you who have believed, don't put yourselves before Allah and His Messenger, but fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is all-hearing and all-knowing. So the surah itself, it starts off by addressing us. It's speaking directly to us as believers, those who have faith. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah by saying, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O you who have believed. So this is a direct address to us as believers. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this phrase, He's grabbing our attention. Right? The reason why He's speaking to us directly is to grab our attention, to make sure we're listening, to make sure we're listening carefully. And now He's either going to command us with something good, something that's beneficial for ourselves, or He's going to give us a prohibition that will protect us from some type of harm. And this is what Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma told us, that whenever we see this phrase in the Qur'an, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, one of two things is going to happen. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to command us with something that will benefit us, or He's going to prohibit something that could potentially harm us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ don't put yourselves before Allah and His messengers, so the, or, or His messenger. So the commentators, the mufassirun, they mention what, what this means is don't rush in making statements regarding faith or religion. Don't rush in giving rulings or religious advice or anything else before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Basically, don't give your opinion. Don't give what you think before Allah and His Messenger say anything regarding that particular matter. Don't make any suggestions to Allah and His Messenger concerning your affairs or life in general. Don't assume to have knowledge or insight into something before Allah has revealed something regarding it through the Prophet So the general wording of the verse, لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ It's a very general, it's a very broad statement. So it's inclusive of every type of thing. Right, the general wording of the verse prohibits going ahead of the Prophet ﷺ in both words and deeds. And this is actually an express prohibition of going against the Qur'an and Sunnah in anything whatsoever. So one of the meanings that are derived or one of the meanings derived from this verse is don't go against the Qur'an and don't go against the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's what Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said regarding this verse. He says, don't say anything that opposes the Qur'an and Sunnah. And then Dhahak rahimahullah said, don't make a judgment on any question relating to your faith without waiting for judgment of God and His Messenger. Qatada rahimahullah said, we were told that some people used to say, revelation should be sent down about such and such matters. And such and such practices should be rendered aloud. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disliked this attitude. Mujahid rahimahullah said, The verse orders believers not to precipitate what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi might say. They have to wait until Allah has made his judgment clear through his messenger. So basically what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing in this portion of the verse is that he's encouraging the companions radiallahu anhum and us as believers to adopt a certain attitude. That when it comes to Allah and His Messenger وسلم, when it comes to matters of faith and religion, we're supposed to have this particular attitude. That we're not supposed to make a judgment concerning anything without first referring to the Qur'an and Sunnah. So any aspect of our lives, any decisions we make, any conclusions that we come to, they should all be based upon what's mentioned in the Qur'an or what the Prophet Sallallahu has taught us. And unfortunately, this is an attitude that we have started to lose at a very slow and steady pace. Right? People, they no longer feel any hesitation when speaking about Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu and our deen. Everybody thinks that they're an expert because they have, MashaAllah, Mufti, Google, and Sheikh YouTube. 
So whenever there's a religious question, whenever there's a, something that comes up, everybody has their own personal opinion. And they're basing it off their own understanding or their misunderstanding. They're basing, basing it off their own perceptions, their own concepts or their own ideas. And they're trying to fit those into the Qur'an and Sunnah. Whereas they're not actually going with what the Qur'an and Sunnah say. So they say that that also comes under the prohibition of this verse. لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسول. So they feel no fear whatsoever in saying, I think this and I think that, based upon their own flawed understandings. And this was never the attitude of the companions radiallahu anhuma or the great scholars of the past. They never had this attitude, they never had this, you could say the courage to speak about religious matters or religious affairs without having knowledge, without having some type of background, without having some type of proof from the Qur'an or Sunnah. When they would give a religious ruling, they recognized that they were assuming to speak on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a very important, a very significant point to understand. That when you're talking about religion, when we speak about religion, when we speak about legal rulings, or when we say something is haram and something is halal, we're doing what? You're speaking on behalf of whom? Allah. Right, you're speaking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a very, very, I mean, that's a huge thing to do. So the scholars of the past, when they would do that, it would bring fear into their hearts. They would actually have a real perceptible sense of fear in their hearts. And that's why they felt no shame whatsoever in saying, I don't know. La adri. So we all heard that famous story of Imam Malik rahimahullah where someone traveled from a very, very far distance to come ask him about some religious affairs. Imam Malik rahimahullah was known as the most knowledgeable person of his time. So someone traveled this long distance to come ask him questions. And I think the narration mentions he asked him 40 questions or 80 questions. And for every question, Imam Malik simply said, La adri, I don't know. So the person was shocked. You're Imam Malik, you're the most knowledgeable person. What will I tell the people when I go back to them? What am I going to tell my people? So Imam Malik told them, tell them that Imam Malik says, La adri, I don't know. And the reason for that attitude, the reason for that type of behavior was again because of their fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was because of this prohibition. لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله. They understood the significance, they understood the importance of not saying anything based on their own personal opinions or their own personal understandings. That everything they said regarding religion had to be something that's grounded in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَاتَّقُوا الله. And fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah is all hearing and all knowing. So be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what we say and what we do. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all seeing and the all hearing. He hears every single thing that we say publicly and privately, openly and secretly, loudly and quietly. And He's fully aware of every single thing that we do. And if a person, if we adopt taqwa, if we have taqwa, if we're conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we truly recognize that He is as sami and that He is Al-Alim, then we would never say anything without knowledge. Right? We would never say anything without understanding what the Qur'an and Sunnah say regarding it. So this type of attitude would ensure that we would never speak without knowledge or say anything contradictory to the Qur'an and Sunnah. Another commentator mentioned that this verse indicates towards the principles of interpretation. And what that means is that the procedure a person should follow when faced with a religious question. And this is something that's it's commonly known, it's all of us know it, that the first source is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If there's a religious question that arises, if there's something that needs to be understood within a religious context, the first place we're supposed to look is the Qur'an. If we don't find the answer in the Qur'an, then we're supposed to go towards the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Then if we don't find it, then you are supposed to go to our own reasoning, but that reasoning has to be grounded in the Qur'an and Sunnah. And that's based off that famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, 
when he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu an to Yemen as a governor and he asked him how will you judge right when you go to Yemen how are you going to rule how are you going to judge so Mu'adh radiyallahu an replied according to the book of Allah so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then asked what if you don't find it there Mu'adh radiyallahu an replied then according to the sunnah of the messenger of Allah the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked and if you don't find it there he replied, then I will exercise my judgment to the best of my ability. Right? If I don't find it in the Quran, I don't find it in the Sunnah, then I will use my own understanding. I'll use my own interpretive skills to come up with a judgment or a conclusion. And the Prophet ﷺ then struck him on the chest and said, All praise is to Allah who guided the messenger of the messenger of Allah to what pleases his messenger. Now it's also important to remember that this procedure applies to those individuals who are qualified to do this right using your own judgment based off the Quran and Sunnah is not an easy it's not a simple ta uh, 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 task it's something that you have to be trained and qualified to do so you have to have the qualifications so this applies to those individuals who are actually qualified to do ijtihad who have the prerequisites to interpret the Quran and Sunnah based off of established and accepted principles Right, so again, the whole essence of this first verse is teaching us a particular attitude, a particular etiquette that we're supposed to have. And that attitude is, we're not supposed to say anything based off of our own opinions. We're not supposed to proceed. We're not supposed to put our own personal opinions ahead of those of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله and the main driving factor behind that, the thing that will always keep us in check, is taqwa. What taqullah? Having fear of Allah, being conscious of Allah. And something that builds the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is recognizing that He's what? as samiyah and al alim If a person remembers that his Lord and his Creator hears every single thing that they say, then that's going to create what? Consciousness of what you say. You're going to have taqwa in your statements. If you recognize that Allah is al alim He's the all-knowing, that creates consciousness in your actions. You're going to be very careful about what you do. All right, in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us another etiquette. And this is an etiquette that should be observed in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to maintain respect and honor. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawt al-nabi, wa la tajharu lahu bil qawli ka jahri ba'dikum li ba'din, an tahbata a'malukum wa antum la tash'urun. That, O oh, you who have believed, don't raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet or be loud to him in speech, like the loudness of some of you to others, lest your deeds become worthless, while you perceive not. So again, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts by speaking to us directly. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. And as soon as we hear this phrase, as soon as we hear this portion of the verse, again, we're supposed to start listening. We're supposed to start, start uh, paying attention, listening closely. Because this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord and Creator, speaking to us directly. Now, in the context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is speaking directly to whom? Who are these verses revealed to? The Sahaba. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the companions radiallahu anhum directly. That, O oh, you who have believed amongst the companions in Allah and His Messenger, when you speak to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't raise your voices over his. Speaking to him in a raised voice, is a sign of disrespect. And while speaking to him in a lowered voice, is a sign of respect and honor. So again, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the believers that they shouldn't raise their voices above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor should they speak to him in a loud tone as they do with one another. The way they address and speak to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it should be different than the way they address and speak to one another. So this is a very important principle when it comes to dealing with other individuals. That you're supposed to show them their due respect and their due honor. 
that when you speak to a child, you speak to them differently. When you speak to your friends, you speak to them differently. When you speak to an adult, you're supposed to speak to them differently. So the way that the, the companion should address the Prophet them, it's supposed to be very different than the way that they speak to one another. So they shouldn't call him by his name saying, Ya Muhammad or Ya Ahmed. Rather, they should call him with respect saying, Ya Nabi, Ya Allah or Ya Rasulullah. The O Prophet of Allah or O Messenger of Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also warns them that if they neglect this etiquette, if they neglect this etiquette, it can lead to their good deeds being wasted because it's a sign of their disrespect towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Lest your deeds go worthless while you perceive not. So the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this is that their good deeds would go to waste if they showed disrespect to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Qurtubi rahimahullah, he mentions that six narrations are mentioned as the background of revelation for these particular verses. So these initial verses of Surah Al-Hujarat, they were revealed in a specific context, in a specific background, in response to certain things that took place during the time of the Prophet Wasallam. In Imam Qurtubi, he mentions six different narrations. And all of these narrations are included within the general meanings of the verse. So it's possible that they could all be a part of the background. They could all be the sababun nuzul. So for example, it's narrated in Sahih Bukhari that once some people from the tribe of Tamim came to the Prophet wasallam, And during their stay, one of the issues that came up was who should be appointed as the leader of the tribe. Right? So this tribe, Banu Tamim, they came to the Prophet wasallam and they accepted Islam. Now the discussion arose that who amongst them should be appointed as their leader. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu he suggested Al Qa'qa ibn Ma'bad. Right? He suggested a particular person. And Umar radiallahu an suggested Al Aqra ibn Habis. So Abu Bakr radiallahu an told Umar radiallahu an that the only reason you suggested someone else is because you want to oppose me. Right? The only reason you're suggesting someone else than me is because you want to oppose me. So Umar radiallahu an responded, I don't want to oppose you. And then they started going back and forth until their voices escalated. Their voices became loud. And in response to that, this particular voice was this particular verse was revealed. La aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. That don't raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu he narrated that after this verse was revealed, Abu Bakr radiallahu an swore that he would speak to the Prophet وسلم, like someone who whispers to another. Right, as we can see, this verse was revealed, or when this verse was revealed, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they became very cautious and they became very apprehensive. Right, the verse actually affected their hearts. It changed their behavior. It changed the way they used to speak to one another. Anas radiallahu an narrated, when this verse was revealed, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi Until the end of the verse, Thabit ibn Qais, radiyallahu an, whose voice was loud, said, I was the one who raised his voice above the voice of Allah's Messenger. I am amongst the dwellers of the fire. My good deeds have been done in vain. So basically this companion, he thought that the verse was revealed regarding him. Right, Thabit ibn Qais radiallahu an, he had a very loud voice. And when he spoke, he spoke with a very loud voice. So when this verse was revealed, he thought the verse was revealed regarding him. So he became extremely sad, he became depressed, and he went and hid in his house. And he remained in his house feeling distressed and disturbed. And then he, he was in his house for so long that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa noticed his absence. So he asked, where in the world is Thabit ibn Qais? So some of the companions went to him and said that the Prophet ﷺ has noticed your absence. What's the matter with you? Thabit radiallahu an said, I used to raise my voice above the voice of the Prophet and I spoke loudly in front of him. My deeds have been rendered useless and I am amongst the people of the fire. So they went to the Prophet ﷺ and told him what Thabit said and the Prophet ﷺ said, Rather, 
he is amongst the people of paradise. بَلْ هُوَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ So Thabit radiallahu anhu, he thought that the verse was revealed regarding him, but in reality, it wasn't talking about him. And his concern and his fear was something that was a proof that he was a person of faith and a person who showed respect to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas radiallahu anhu commented, we used to see Thabit walk amongst us, knowing that he was to be amongst the people of paradise. During the battle of Yamama, our forces suffered a retreat. Suddenly, Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shamas came, having put on Hanut and shrouds and said, the worst habit is the one you acquire from your enemy. And don't set a bad example for your companions. And he went on fighting until he was martyred. Radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. So the reason why Anas radiallahu anhu mentions this, the reason why Anas radiallahu anhu mentions this is because to show the status of Thabit radiallahu anhu. Right? Thabit radiallahu anhu, he was told that he was a person of paradise. بَلْ أَنْتَ مِنْ أَهْلِ Jannah. And despite that fact, he did what? He went and fought in the path of Allah and was martyred. Right? If, if one of us were told we're from the people of paradise, we'd probably sit at home and do nothing. But Thabit radiallahu anhu, he went and he actually strove and, and, and led in this battle and he was martyred. Right, after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited speaking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a loud voice just as one speaks loudly to another in a way that offends him. Instead, they were required to speak to him in terms of respect, honor, and calmness. All right, so this is again is an extremely, extremely important etiquette to have when dealing with people in general. Right, this is an extremely important adab that all of us should have when interacting with other people. That when we speak to people, we should always speak to them in a soft, gentle voice. There's no need to be loud, to be obnoxious, to be rude, right? To speak to someone in a very, I guess you could say, in a very negative way, in a demeaning way. And this applies to every person that we speak to. So again, whether, whether we're speaking to children, we should speak to them in a kind and gentle, and a, a kind and gentle manner that shows shafaqah. It shows rahmah, it shows mercy, it shows kindness. When we speak to our friends, it should be something that shows respect. When we speak to our elders, it should be something that even shows more respect. And that's derived from this verse. That you, when, you, when you're speaking to someone who has such a high status, don't speak to them in an offensive way. All right, so we should speak to each other with a sense of mutual respect, honor, and love. Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi rahimullah, says, The respect for the Prophet wasallam after he passed away is just as compulsory as it was during his lifetime. All right. Now all of us, we never had the blessing of interacting with the Prophet Wasallam. Inshallah Allah gives us that blessing in the hereafter. But since we can't interact with him in the life of this world, we can still act upon this verse. We can still act upon this verse by showing respect to the Prophet Wasallam in different ways. And one of the ways that's mentioned is that when we are given the opportunity to visit his grave in Medina. When you're given the opportunity to visit his grave in Medina, you're not supposed to speak in a loud voice in his masjid or in front of his grave. And as a matter of fact, this verse is written above his what? The, the verse is written above his grave. All right, that's why some scholars have expressed the view that it's disrespectful to say salam or speak loudly in front of the Prophet Wasallam's resting place. So once Umar radiallahu an he heard two people speaking loudly in the Prophet's mosque. He went to them and said, Do you realize where you are? And then he asked them, Where are you from? They replied, We are from Ta'if. So he said, Had you been from Medina, I would have had you beaten. Right? That's Umar radiallahu anhu. He's saying that if these two people, if they weren't foreigners, if they weren't strangers, he would have had them beaten because of the disrespect they were showing in front of the grave of the Prophet Similarly, it's considered disrespectful to make noise where prophetic traditions are being recited. Right? When we're reading a hadith, when we're studying hadith, or when we're listening to a lecture regarding hadith, it's considered disrespectful to speak during that. Right? It's, sign, it's a sign of disrespect, it's a sign of not 
giving respect to the Prophet ﷺ. Because when the blessed words of the Prophet ﷺ are being recited, we should be listening to them silently. And again, there are amazing stories narrated about Imam Malik rahimahullah and the amount of respect he had for the ahadith of the Prophet So Imam Malik held the hadith of the Prophet in such reverence that he never narrated anything nor did he give a fatwa until he was in the state of ritual purity. Right, Imam Malik, he would never read hadith without being in the state of wudu. He would never narrate hadith without being in the state of wudu. Similarly, he would never give a fatwa without being in the state of wudu. Right, Ismail ibn Abi Uwais rahimullah said, I asked my uncle Malik about something. He told me to sit down, he made ablution, then he sat on the couch and said, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. And he did not give fatwa, except he said this first. All right, look at the amount of adab, look at the amount of akhlaq or etiquettes they had towards anything that had to do with religion. All right? Even before answering a simple question, Imam Malik would first go do wudu. After making wudu, he would say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. And then he would answer the question. Qutayba said when we went to see Malik, he would come out to us adorned, wearing kuhl on his eyes, perfumed, wearing his best clothes, sit at the head of the circle, call for palm leaf fans, and then give each one of us a fan as well. So Qutayba he's describing the dars, the lesson of Imam Malik. That when Imam Malik rahimullah used to come to teach hadith, he would put on his best clothes. He would come out adorned, he would be wearing his best clothes. He would put kuhl on his eyes. He would wear the best perfume, the best itar. And then he would ask for people to be comfortable in that gathering as well. He would have people fanning it. All right, so again, this was all done to show what? Respect. All of this was done to show respect to the words of the Prophet wasallam. There's another incident where it's mentioned that once he was narrating hadith, and as he was narrating hadith, his face started to change color. Right? His face turned red and then it turned purple and, it was, and, it, and you could see that he was feeling some type of discomfort. So after the lesson was over, his students asked him that, Yo, Imam Malik, we saw your face changing colors. We saw that you were feeling some type of discomfort. What was going on? So he said, as I was narrating these hadith, I was being stung by a scorpion. But since I was in the middle of a hadith, which were the words of the Prophet ﷺ, I did not want to interrupt them. So I waited until after narrating the hadith to stop to get rid of the scorpion. All right, so all of these again are just amazing incidents, amazing examples of how much honor, of how much respect that the great scholars of the past had for the words of the Prophet ﷺ. So that's the example that we're supposed to follow. Right? What we're studying and what we study specifically when it comes to hadith we're supposed to have that type of adab, that type of respect, that type of etiquette towards it as well. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the verse by mentioning the reason why we've been commanded not to raise our voices above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Lest your deeds become worthless while you perceive not. So sometimes we might say or do something and not even recognize the consequences of that statement or action. Right, so in this portion of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting the fact that our tongues are extremely dangerous. We could say something that is so bad, that's so harmful, and we don't even recognize the harm or the effect of that statement, but it could cause all of our good deeds to go to waste. So the Prophet ﷺ told us, إِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَيَتَكَلَّمُ بِالْكَلِمَةِ مِنْ رِضْوَانِ اللَّهِ لَا يُلْقِي لَهَا بَالًا يُكْتَبُ لَهُ بِهَا الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَيَتَكَلَّمُ بِالْكَلِمَةِ مِنْ سَخَةِ اللَّهِ لَا يُلْقِي لَهَا بَالًا يَهْوِي بِهَا فِي النَّارِ أَبْعَدَ مَا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ That sometimes a man will speak a word and that word is so pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that person doesn't even recognize it but just because of that word the person is given paradise Right? Sometimes we might say something and we don't even give any significance to it. We don't even think it's important. 
But that word that we said, that thing that we said was so pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that because of it, He will give us paradise. But the opposite is also true. That sometimes we might say something that we consider to be insignificant. But it's so bad, it's so horrible that it angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to such an extent that because of that one word will be thrown into the fire a distance of what's between the heaven and the earth. Right? So in this portion of the verse again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us, He's reminding us about the power of our tongues and how we're supposed to be careful in what we say and what we, uh, how we speak. All right. So again the main, the main essence of this verse has to do with etiquette and showing respect to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam specifically in our speech. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَغُضُّونَ أَصْوَاتَهُمْ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ Indeed, those who lower their voices before the Messenger of Allah, they are the ones whose hearts Allah has tested for righteousness. For them is forgiveness and great reward. Meaning, those individuals, those believers, who follow this particular etiquette and show the utmost honor and respect to the Prophet ﷺ in both speech and manners when speaking to him and when sitting in his company Allah has purified their hearts and made their hearts a residence and a dwelling place for taqwa right? so those who follow this etiquette they lowered their voices, they showed respect, they showed honor to the Prophet ﷺ Allah has made their hearts a residence, a dwelling place for taqwa. Taqwa is allowed to enter into their hearts. Right, so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that there are two things that cause us to attain forgiveness and a great reward. What are those two things? Adab and taqwa. Right? Adab and taqwa. Having proper etiquette, having proper manners, along coupled with God consciousness, being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we have these two things, then we get maghfirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive our faults, He'll forgive our shortcomings, He will forgive our sins, and then He will give us ajrun azim. And most of the commentators mention that ajrun azim is referring to paradise. So they say the path to paradise is through adab and taqwa. All right. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجُرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Indeed, those who call you, O Muhammad, from behind the chambers, most of them don't use reason. And if they had been patient until you came out to them, it would have been better for them. But Allah is forgiving and merciful. All right, these verses, they're referring to an event, they're referring to an incident that took place in the ninth year after Hijrah. The ninth year after Hijrah, it's known as Amul Wufud. It's known as the year of delegations. Because delegations from all over Arabia arrived in Medina to embrace Islam and pledge their allegiance to the Prophet So this was after the conquest of Mecca. After the conquest of Mecca, a lot of the Arab tribes accepted Islam and they sent delegations to the Prophet in Medina to pledge their allegiance. So this, a delegation from Banu Tamim arrived in Medina in the afternoon. And they came to the Prophet while he was resting in one of his wife's apartments. Now the people of Banu Tamim, they were Bedouins. So they weren't aware of the normal social customs and proper etiquettes of calling on the Prophet ﷺ. So they stood outside the room and they said, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj ilayna. That, O oh Muhammad, come out and speak to us. So obviously this was something that is what? Disrespectful. It's disrespectful, it's ill-mannered. right? But that's not, they weren't to blame for that, they didn't know any better. They were Bedouins from the desert. They didn't know the proper social customs. They didn't know how to interact properly with the Prophet ﷺ. So when they came to Medina, they came directly to one of the, 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 the rooms and they said, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj ilayna. 
So in response to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these particular verses. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's highlighting their lack of etiquette and their ignorance regarding how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should be called upon. Now the hujarat being referred to in this verse, these were the chambers or apartments of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a hujra, it's a four-walled apartment or dwelling with a roof and a courtyard. Right, so hujra, it's basically, a, it has four walls, it has a roof, and then it has a courtyard as well. There's a little bit of a courtyard in front of it. And there, um, in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ had nine wives. And each of them had their own apartment where the Prophet ﷺ would come and stay. And there are actually some narrations that give a brief description of what these rooms look like and how big they were. All right, so these rooms, they were made from palm branches and their doors were covered with thick black woolen curtains. All right, so they were constructed, they were built with the branches of palm trees. And the doors of the hujra, it was covered with a thick black curtain. Imam Bukhari, rahimullah, in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, he brings a narration that describes their size. He says, from the door of the roof part was about 10.5 feet. All right, from the door, <clears throat> meaning from the door of the courtyard until the part that was covered with the roof was about 10 feet. So how big is 10 feet? Not that big. All right, so from the door, from where that black curtain is, until the roof part of the building, there was 10 feet. So that was the length of the courtyard. The room itself was 10 cubits, meaning 15 feet. All right, 15 feet by 15 feet. And the height of the roof was about 8 feet. So these, these apartments, these rooms were not that big. And they were very, very simple. All right. Later on, these rooms were added to the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ. So all of these hujarat, these rooms were around the masjid. And later on in history, they actually became part of the masjid itself. All right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's saying that the proper thing for them to have done would have been to wait for the Prophet ﷺ himself to come out so that they could speak to him. Right? وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ And again, it's important to note that these rough manners or lack of etiquette, it wasn't because of some fault that they have. It was simply a lack of knowledge. It was their ignorance. They didn't know what the proper etiquette was. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends by saying وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ and Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. So the companions radiallahu anhuma or anhum and their followers showed the same respect and courtesy to their scholars and teachers as well. Alright, so they say one of the lessons that can be derived from this is that whenever there's a person, a figure, an individual who has some type of authority, whenever there's an individual who is I guess he deserves to be treated with respect. That could be your parents. It could be your murabbi. It could be your teacher. It could be your imam. It could be your local scholars. Whoever it may be. Whoever deserves to be shown respect. The same type of etiquette should be kept with them. That you're not supposed to speak to them in a loud voice. Right? You should show respect when calling upon them. You shouldn't call them at all times of the day. You should make sure that you call them at a time when you know that they're free you shouldn't email them constantly and expect a response within like two minutes and if they don't respond then you send them a text message hey you didn't respond to my email <laughs> right you're supposed to show that type of etiquette and show that type of respect to anyone who is in that type of status or in that type of position and that's why it's mentioned when ibn abbas radiallahu anhuma wanted to inquire about any prophetic tradition from any knowledgeable companion he would go to that person's house and sit at the door without calling him or knocking at the door. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he was only 10 years old when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. So he learned a lot of ahadith from different companions. And whenever he found out a companion had some hadith that he had not heard yet, he would actually travel to that companion to listen, it, listen to it from him. So he would go to their house, but he wouldn't knock on their door, he wouldn't call on them. He would simply sit down outside and wait until they came out. Right? So he would wait there until the companion himself came out. And when the companion would come out, he would ask him about the hadith. 
However, the companion himself would say to Ibn Abbas that, O oh, cousin of Allah's Messenger, why didn't you knock at the door and inform me about your arrival? Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma would reply, A scholar in his community is like a prophet. And Allah has directed us that we should wait until he comes out on his own. So basically they would show the same etiquette, the same respect to their teachers that they were supposed to show to whom? To the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alright, so these first five verses of Surah Al-Hujarat, they deal with specific adab, with specific etiquettes that should be maintained when dealing with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those same etiquettes can be extended again to any person or any individual who has a position of authority, who has a position of respect. And again, those etiquettes, those general etiquettes are speaking in the proper manner, speaking with proper etiquette, speaking to them in a tone, in a tone of voice that shows respect, that shows honor, that shows dignity. And for us, the way we do that towards the Prophet ﷺ is showing respect towards his not only in front of his grave, but also his ahadith. Right? When the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ are being recited, when they're being taught, when they're being studied, there's a certain etiquette, there's a certain adam that goes with it. Part of those ada, part of those etiquettes are to have wudu, right? To not be distracted, to not talk when they're being recited, to not kind of, you know, distract from the lesson that's being taught. All right. And then, then the, the other etiquette is how to call upon him and how to speak to him properly. All right. Are there any questions from these five verses? All right. So inshallah tomorrow we will do the next set of verses. Inshallah tomorrow we will do the next set of verses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us from all of us. Peace on our scale of good deeds on the day of judgment. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik.